Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patsala. Myself, Parthopotim Bora from Department of Sociology, Dibugar University, Assam. Today, we'll discuss on the module Introductory Overview of the Frankfurt School from the paper Contemporary Social Theory. In this module, we'll basically give an introduction to the Frankfurt School. We'll discuss the basic theme of the Frankfurt School, the trajectory of the Frankfurt School over the years. We'll also have a critical appraisal of the works of the Frankfurt School. So the module basically will be based on the works that were done by the different scholars that were associated with the Frankfurt School. The term Frankfurt School basically associated with the critical school of the thought that was in the Institute of Social Research at the Frankfurt University in Germany. Although over the years, the Frankfurt School had a kind of geographical shift in the different location, but what bind the commonality or what was the commonality between the various school, various part was the unique understanding that is a critical reappraisal of Marxism. While understanding the overview of the Frankfurt School, we can see the nature of shift that was taking place in the nature of understanding of Marxism by the Frankfurt School. In fact, the development of the Frankfurt School under the directorship of Karl Grunberg was defined from that of the work that was done by the Frankfurt School under the directorship of Max Horkheimer. So now I would like to discuss the work of the Frankfurt School under the directorship of Karl Grunberg. Karl Grunberg started the Frankfurt School at the, at the Institute of Social Research in 1923. The work that was done by the Frankfurt School under his leadership was different because Karl Gunberg was basically an Austro-Marxist and the nature of Marxism he was advocating could not differentiate between the theory and practice. In fact, what Karl, Berg, Karl Gunberg was saying, Marxism as he, as he see it is basically neither a philosophy nor a abstract thing, rather, it is a kind of change that are taking place in the world. But after the assuming of directorship by the Max Horkheimer in 1930, that was followed by the joining of the school by the people like Theodore Adorno, Harvard Marcus, there were certain shifts that were taking place in the nature of understanding that was associated with the Frankfurt School. In fact, we can see the shift from the nature of understanding which was not as similar to that of the nature of understanding that was provided by Karl Grunberg. We see that after the coming of the Max Horkheimer, there was an important role of the critical theory of Hegelian in the understanding of society that was taking part by the Frankfurt School. So if we can take the well-known work of the traditional and the critical theory by Horkheimer, where he argues that Traditional theory are influenced by philosophy of positivism and empiricism and that is they have a legacy of natural science. Critical theory do not support the study of society purely from the external standpoint and that's, that has something to, to do with the transcending rationality and individual purpose. What Horkheimer was basically doing, he was basically trying to draw a distinction between the natural science approach of the, or the traditional approach to that of the critical theory and in that context what Horkheimer was saying that the critical understanding is defined from that of the empiricist or the positivist understanding that is seen in case of natural sciences. Again, the two main aspects of critical theory of Horkheimer was a pessimistic evaluation of the emancipatory rule of the working class and second was the political significance of the role of the critical intellectual. So when he says there is a pessimistic rule of the emancipatory rule of the working class or the role of the critical intellectual, it was basically the work of the young Hegelian that we see in the work of the Max Horkheimer. Next, we'll discuss about the understanding of modern society and how it was done by the Frankfurt School. The increasing influence of American society over the globe had an influence over the work that was done by the Frankfurt School. In fact, the Frankfurt School was highly critical of the enlightenment as well as modern capitalism. It is because according to Frankfurt School, 
The enlightenment is associated with a kind of rationalism which is problematic because it do not give space for the critical understanding. So as a result, say for example, we can talk about the knowledge and human interest that was published by Habermas that criticized positivism or scientism for a replacement of theory of knowledge with a methodology which do not have philosophical thought. So basically, the Frankfurt School was critical of the positivism or the scientific approach because it do not give any space for the critical understanding. On the other hand, it also do not give any space for the philosophical thought. So in that context, the understanding of modern society propagated by the Frankfurt School was critical of the enlightenment that was only based on the rationality but it was not associated with the critical thought. Another important theme of the Frankfurt School was understanding of authority and personality and anti-Semitism. The authority and personality and the family is an important way for the understanding or the research for the Frankfurt School. Frankfurt School provided a critical understanding of authority and personality from the psychological approach. What they did, they basically criticized the authority and personality or again they criticized the family from the psychological approach because of the nature of domination that they have. There was also a criticism against the psychological interpretation of the authority or the family that was given by the Frankfurt School because it do not provide a kind of sociological explanation for the understanding of authority and personality by the Frankfurt School. Another important work of the Frankfurt School was One Dimensional Man by Harvard Marcus. Harvard Marcus provided a critical understanding of industrial society in his one of the classic work One Dimensional Man. He is critical of the industrial society because of the enlightenment or the nature of rationality that is provided by the enlightenment in the industrial society. The work basically is important because of its significance in understanding modern industrial society. For Marcuse, one dimensional man revolves around two hypotheses. The first, that advanced industrial society can contain the qualitative changes in the near future. Second, there are some forces and tendencies which may break this to explore the society. In the conclusion, Marcus said that one dimension society there is an alternate relation between rational and irrational. So basically, he was critical of the work of the industrial society, how it is working in our society and how it may be problematic for the future working of the industrial society. In another important work, Reason and Revolution, Marcus provided a dialectical social theory as a centric criticism to the positivist orientation of the social science that tries to see the laws of society as similar to the laws of nature because the laws of society need not be the similar to the laws of nature. It is a kind of positivist orientation which was criticized by the Harvard Marcus. Although the criticism of positive philosophy of society provided by Marcus was somewhat similar to Horkheimer, but it was different because the philosophy of the Marcus was basically based on the philosophy of Hegel. So because the philosophy of the Marcus was basically based on the philosophy of Hegel, so as a result, we can say that the understanding of the Marcus is defined from the understanding which was provided by that of the Max Horkheimer. Uh, another important scholar that is associated with the Frankfurt School is Walter Benjamin and his work on the historical material aesthetics. The important contribution of the Walter Benjamin was greatly associated with the nature of art, the elitist nature of the art and how it is associated with a mechanical reproduction. So in his work, Walter Benjamin basically criticized art because of his elitist nature and it also have a kind of mechanical reproduction. On the one hand, Walter Benjamin also see the problematic part in the materialism because materialism is propagated or it try to reproduce the bourgeois philosophy without looking into how it is actually reproducing in our society. So it does not give any space for the political revolution in our society because of the mechanical reproduction of the bourgeois philosophy. As a result, Walter Benjamin is critical of the materialism. The nature of the shift that were taking place in the nature of understanding of Frankfurt School or 
the nature of the geographical shift that were taking place in the Frankfurt School had some impact in the nature of understanding of the critical theory provided by the Frankfurt School. As we already discussed, Frankfurt School over the period of time because of the socio-political context had to shift from the Germany to America, again they came back to the Germany. So the work of the Frankfurt School in the post Second World War period that were taking place in the Germany under the leadership of the Jürgen Habermas and his colleague provided a different understanding of the Frankfurt School. Jürgen Habermas is one of the most dominant scholar of the Frankfurt School in the second phase of the Frankfurt School. In his two volume work, The Theory of Communicative Action, Jürgen Habermas basically emphasizes on the question of rationality. He tries to give an evolutionary perspective of rationality and thereby he was basically providing critical reappraisal of Marxism. Jürgen Habermas basically tries to draw a distinction between instrumental action and rational action and the communicative action in is a basically a new introduction that was given by the Jürgen Habermas. Jürgen Habermas was critical of Marx because according to Habermas, Marx's failure lies in his inability to draw a distinction between the instrumental action and the communicative action. In the similar line, he basically provided a critical reappraisal of Marxism. Although there are large number of differences that are there between the Habermas understanding or the Marxist understanding, there is also a kind of similarity that is the revolutionary reconstitution of the society. While the Marx talk about the revolutionary reconstitution of the society in terms of classless society, Habermas understanding was different. The Heber what Habermas was basically focusing, he was basically fo focusing on the ideal peace situation that is a kind of peace situation where everybody is equal to express their speech. For Habermas, there are the two important things that formed an important component of the domination. In fact, he was critical of the modern society because of the rationality. He said that modern society is problematic because of the large domination that rationality have on our life. In order to do away with that rationality, Habermas basically gave emphasis on the rationality of the communicative action. What does the rationality of communicative action for Habermas means? It is basically ideal speech situation. The term that was conceptualized by the Habermas was the public sphere. The public sphere is basically the understanding of the society where there is a possibility of the free expression of our view, there is a possibility of debate and discussion and ideology or domination will not determine which view or the viewpoint will emerge as victorious. So, the, the theory of communicative action provided by the Jürgen Habermas in the second phase of the Frankfurt School was important contribution of the Frankfurt School. In fact, his work is seen as an important departure from the earlier predecessor. If we see the works that were done by the various scholars, we also can see one of the important criticism of the Frankfurt School was the kind of criticism that was raised against the orthodox Marxism. For Frankfurt School, the, the orthodox Marxism need to be criticized because of the historical understanding of the socio-economic development in the society. Frankfurt School also criticized the work of Stalinism. In fact, they were criticized of the humanist Marxism that was provided by the Stalin. So, basically the kind of mechanical understanding of the orthodox Marxism was criticized by the Frankfurt School. If we see the kind of criticism that was offered against the Frankfurt School, we can say that Frankfurt School was not ag against any criticism. If we see the kind of criticism that was offered against Frankfurt School, we, see, we can say that there were a lot of criticism that was offered against Frankfurt School. One of the important criticism that was raised against the Frankfurt School was that although the Frankfurt School was put within the broader domain of neo-Marxist school, but there was no attempt that was seen among the scholars of the Frankfurt School 
to reassess the work of the marks. In fact, the reassessing of the work of the marks was not the form or the component of the Frankfurt School radar. It was basically reappraisal of the Marxism. So as a result, Frankfurt School was criticized because it was not directly associated with Marxism radar. It was merely a kind of critical understanding of the Marxist philosophy. Although there were many criticism because of in the similar line, but the historical importance or the theoretical importance of Frankfurt School is seen everywhere because of the large influence not only in the sociology but even in the other discipline. In fact, the historical or the legacy of the Frankfurt School continue in the work of the critical understanding of our society in terms of the reappraisal of the Marxist theory. So in this module, we basically provided an overview of the Frankfurt School. So an overview of the Frankfurt School help you to understand the Frankfurt School as a kind of neo-Marxist understanding. It also helped to see the trajectory that was taking place in the work of the Frankfurt School, the various scholars that were associated with the Frankfurt School, the different understanding of Frankfurt School at a different point of time, the ideological shift that were taking place in the work of Frankfurt School. Apart from that, it also provided how the Frankfurt School was also criticized because of their inability to reassess the work of Marx. So I think that will be helpful for the further research. You can see the references that were given in the module. Theodor Wiesengrunde Dorno was born in Frankfurt in 1903 into a wealthy and cultured family. His father, a wine merchant, was of Jewish origin but had converted to Protestantism at university. Until his twenties, Adorno planned for a career as a composer, but eventually focused on philosophy. In 1934, he was barred on racial grounds from teaching in Germany, so he moved to Oxford and later to New York and then Los Angeles. He was both fascinated and repelled by Californian consumer culture and thought with unusual depth about suntans and drive-ins. Adorno was closely connected with the pioneering Institute of Social Research, also known as the Frankfurt School, which had been founded and funded by his friend Felix Weil. The Institute aimed to develop a psychological understanding of the problems thrown up by modern capitalism, especially the culture and mindset it generates. Adorno drew attention to three significant ways in which capitalism corrupts and degrades us. Adorno believed that the primary focus for progressive philosophers should be the study of how the working and middle classes of developed nations think and feel, and in particular, the manner in which they spend their evenings and weekends. Adorno had a highly ambitious view of what leisure time should be for. It was not to relax and take one's mind off things. Free time should be our prime opportunity to expand and develop ourselves, to reach after our better nature, and to acquire the tools with which to change society. It's a time when we might see films that can help us to understand our relationships with new clarity, or read books that give us fresh insights into politics, or listen to music that gives us courage to reform ourselves and collective life. But in the modern world, Adorno bemoaned that leisure has fallen into the hands of an omnipresent and deeply malevolent entertainment machine, which he called the culture industry. Modern films, TV, radio, magazines and now social media seemed for Adorno to be almost designed to keep us distracted, unable to understand ourselves and without the will to alter political reality. So for example, the news will feed us a mixture of salacious nonsense and political stories that scramble any possibility of understanding the open prison within which we exist. The cinema shows us the adventures of an alien invasion, while the real calamities of our world go unattended. Pop music focuses relentlessly on the emotions around romantic love, suggesting that happiness can only come from meeting one very special person, rather than awakening us to the pleasures of community and of a more broadly distributed human sympathy. We wander through museum galleries, privately unsure what they really mean and why we should care. The culture industry likes to keep us like that, distracted, pliant, confused, and a bit intimidated. Adorno perceptively described Walt Disney as the most dangerous man in America.
Because of the huge range of consumer goods available in modern capitalism, we naturally suppose that everything we could possibly want is available. The only problem, if there is one, is that we can't afford it. But Adorno pointed out that our real wants are carefully shielded from us by capitalist industry, so that we end up forgetting what it is we truly need and settle instead for desires manufactured for us by corporations without any interest in our true welfare. Though we think we live in a world of plenty, what we really require to thrive, namely tenderness, understanding, calm, insight, community, all these things are in painfully short supply and are utterly disconnected from the present economy. When they're trying to sell us something, advertisers show us the thing that we really want and then connect it to something we don't actually need. So we can see an advert showing a group of friends walking along a beach chatting amiably or a family having a picnic and laughing warmly together. These adverts show us these things because they know we crave community and connection. But the industrial economy prefers to keep us lonely and consuming. So at the end of the adverts, we'll be urged to buy some 25-year-old whiskey or a car so powerful that no road would ever let us legally drive it at top speed. Adorno was writing at the dawn of the age of the psychological questionnaire. These were widely in use in the United States, where they were measuring consumer attitudes and commercial behaviour. Adorno was intrigued by the underlying concept of the questionnaire, and so, together with colleagues, devoted himself to designing a rather different kind of questionnaire, one designed to spot fascists. The questionnaire that he designed asked contributors to assess their level of agreement with statements like, Obedience and respect for authority are the most important virtues children should learn, and if people would talk less and work more, everybody would be better off. And when a person has a problem or worry, it's best for him not to think about it, but to keep busy with more cheerful things. Given the traumas Germany had just been through, it's no surprise that Adorno gave his questionnaire, and what he called the F scale, fascist scale, such attention. His team even sent the F scale to every school in West Germany. But a more widely applicable lesson to be drawn from this experiment is that psychology comes ahead of politics. Long before someone is racist, homophobic or authoritarian, they are, Adorno skillfully suggested, likely to be suffering from psychological frailties and immaturities, which is the task of a good society to get better at spotting and responding to. Rather than leaving problems to fester so long that there's eventually no way to deal with them other than through force, we should learn to understand the psychology of everyday insanity from the earliest moments. Adorno was a left-wing thinker who recognised that the primary obstacles to social progress are cultural and psychological rather than narrowly political or economic. We already have the money, the resources, the time and the skills to make sure that everyone can sleep in a house, stop destroying the planet, is given a fulfilling job and feel supported by the community. So the reason why we continue to suffer and hurt one another is first and foremost because our minds are sick. This is the continuing provocation offered by the beguiling and calmly furious work of Theodore Adorno. Thank you.